RMC is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com. Level up your retro gaming with their joysticks featuring genuine Sanwar arcade parts. And OneClickPrint.com for your photos on canvas, acrylic, gifts and more. Local craftsmen and global delivery. Hello cave dwellers, if I say the words Commodore 64 and music then your instinct is likely to be to shout out Rob Hubbard, the man behind so, so many great tunes on the C64, utilising the famous SID music chip and pushing it to its limits, not just to create great 8-bit music, but to create great music full stop, despite the limitations of the instrument he was working with. And his career reached far further than just the C64 through a period that is perhaps less discussed in interviews that people have with him and hopefully we'll try and change that today because we are blessed to have the company of the man himself for a tea break over the most retro of methods, the old fashioned telephone line. So we can't actually see Rob today, but we do have a cyborg representation of him over here on this vinyl record, which we'll come to a little bit later. So without further ado, Let's get to know, over a cup of tea, Rob Hubbard. So Rob, you're a very generous man with your time. There's lots of interviews out there with you, so I will try and do my best to avoid the usual line of questioning, but we can't avoid one important question to get us going, and that's how did you get started with writing video game music? Um, <laughs> I've been asked this so many times. <laughs> I bet you have. <laughs> um, I was working as a professional musician and um, the, bass, the buzz that was around at the time was that musicians are going to have to get into computers and so I bought a computer. There was a few around at the time but I ended up getting a C64 because it had 64K of memory whereas the others only had like 8 or 16K. And um, I uh, knew it had like a better sound chip than all the others so that was the reason that's the reason why i got a c64 and then i taught myself basic and then uh, because you can't do anything much in basic you have to learn machine code so i learned machine code and um i uh <clears throat> did a game that for a company that uh went bankrupt just before i finished the game and uh, people liked the music, they didn't like the game, but they liked the music. And so then I thought, well, maybe there's an opening just to um, concentrate on music rather than anything else. And uh, I did a lot of mail outs and got nowhere. Nobody was interested. Um, and then I um, did a second mail out with all the, from all the software publishers that I could get contacts from all the magazines and eventually I, I got a couple of jobs and um, after I did uh, Thing on a Spring then it really started to take off and then I, of course I did uh, Monty on the Run and uh, and then things uh, really really heated up then and a lot of work came my way. Yeah, well, we'll come on to those early games shortly. But you, you mentioned there that you were a professional musician first. So, what kind of work were you doing there? Yeah, I was. You know, I played in, I played in lots of different bands, um, and uh, you know, lots of other jobs. I, I mean, at one time, I, um, I've done a lot of uh, jobs arranging and writing. I've done a job as a copyist. Um, and a lot of a lot of different bands playing um different kind of genres so i, w I was pretty uh, well into music before i started the c64 stuff mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you explained your reasoning behind choosing the c64 i was unfortunately a lowly amstrad cpc owner during that period oh. do you have anything positive for us amstrad owners to say about the machine <laughs> um I had an Amstrad green screen, uh -huh. which had the AY chip. Um, the only thing positive I would say was that the AY chip was common amongst the Spectrum 128, the Amstrad, and all the MSX machines, um, and then later on the Atari. And so with all the yeah, common Z80 machines, you could 
um, sometimes get paid three times for doing one job because not all the not all the publishers realised it was the same basic hardware. And with the with the musical background that you explained you had as a professional musician, was that useful in your adoption of the C sixty four, or did you have to break old habits to adapt to video game music? No, I mean, I, no, no, totally not. No, I mean, it was um, complete treading new ground all the time. It was um, a real sort of pioneering type of uh, era to go through all that. Uh, there were no rules, there were no boundaries, and we were all basically um, doing what we felt like, really. Um, I think that when I first started, you know, it was, I was thinking in terms of like, children's music you know like um action biker was a bit like that and some of the early stuff and then um it went into the more electronic and uh more kind of a uh, experimental and more adventurous music mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and you you got your break in the industry you mentioned that you you had a, a wave of uh, demos that you sent out. That that first yeah. wave, did you actually did you get no response whatsoever from, or did you get any feedback from that first wave that went out? No, nothing. Nothing. Wow. Nothing. All the people that turned down Rob Hubbard. <laughs> I was on the verge of basically saying, "Oh well, that's it. I'm going to have to go and study COBOL or something." Oh no. Get a job <laughs> doing COBOL. <laughs> or Pascal or something. Working in the back room of a bank somewhere doing co yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was saying, you know, because um, you, sometimes, you know, as a musician, you tend to think, well, I can't do this all my life because, it, you know, you've got to, at some point, you've got to earn some serious money, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'll, a lot of my friends who were musicians were all starting to drift out of music and starting to do uh, things like learning learning about COBOL and things like that to try to get a, a bit more of a steady job. Mm-hmm. Because you were very much a programmer as well as a musician, weren't you, at the time? I mean, we, after the basic, you, you you were into your assembly, which played yeah, a key yeah, part yeah. in your music creation. I, um, yeah. I had a pretty strong math background from, you know, doing my ear levels. Um so the, the the coding side wasn't that um, wasn't that difficult to get into. Um, once you figured out uh, how the interrupts worked, the um, raster interrupt. Once you once you realise that you you can then change anything uh, fifty times a second, you open up a you know, a Pandora's box of tricks that you can start to apply to the synthesizer chip. And the first time that you got to apply that was, as you mentioned, with the game Thing on a Spring. So we'll have a quick listen to that tune now, Rob. So Thing on a Spring was released in 1985 with its super happy title screen music using the yeah. using that game as an example. How long did it take you to put together the soundtrack for that game? Um, well, actually, some of that tune was something I, I'd already kind of written before. Um, so there was a, um, like about maybe eight bars of, of that I, I'd actually written before because I'd used it to try to get some code working. Um, but I think, you know, the whole thing probably took just a couple of days. Oh, okay. Okay. So was this, 
um, a full-time job for you or did you have another career in parallel to to the video games gig during 80 83 to 88 i was still working as a musician doing um doing gigs in clubs okay in newcastle and did you have a, a, a favoured instrument as a musician? Were you a, a, a keyboardist, or I was mainly a, yeah, I was mainly a keyboard player at that okay. time because everybody wanted um, synthesizers and um, you know electric pianos and stuff, as well as Hammond organs. And I was um, you know doing all sorts of gigs, backing cabaret acts, and all sorts of different things. I was doing about maybe three or four nights a week doing that. Oh, okay. So you were able to earn a living between the two two jobs? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And um, I <laughs> I taught my wife how to do ports so she could uh, port all the data from a C64 onto the <laughs> Amstrad and Spectrum uh, while I was out, you know, doing a gig. And then I get back, you know, eleven or twelve o'clock or something, and then all I'd have to do is work on uh, the um, getting it to work in the programs. So I had a bit of a kind of a production line going at one point. So some of our favourite game music may actually have been ported by by your wife. What's her What's her name, Rob? Oh, uh, uh, Linda is her name. Linda. But, so uh, <laughs> she was mainly doing like the. Uh, the ports to the uh, Spectrum and uh, the Amstrad, mainly. Yeah, yeah. The, the lowly Spectrum and Amstrad owners got the ports. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had a system of where I could notate it, and she she knew how to um, uh, understand my the way I'd notated it and to get it into uh, hexadecimal statements that would work on those machines. So all I had to do was to come back and then work out, you know, get some sounds that would work with it and work out sound effects and things like that. So uh, while you were making, well, Thing on a Spring was for Gremlin Graphics, you were freelance, weren't you, at this point? You weren't, yeah. Yeah, you yeah, weren't yeah, employed yeah. by yeah. them. So Gremlin didn't impose a tool set on you or anything like that. I mean, did you have to code no, your no, own tools? No, no, you know, um, they, were, they were more than happy that I was providing the code and uh, we... Um, arranged where I had to assemble the code and I just gave them the the module and told them the entry points of how to get it to work and they were more than happy for that. Hmm. So so when you submitted a tune to them, it was pure assembly language, was it? And you just told them the start point yeah, to kick it off? Yeah, it was pure binary code and I just told them, you know, the, I think there was like um, three entry points at the beginning and... Um, I just told them what the calls were in you know in order to get it to work, and it was pretty straightforward after that for them and that's it. It just became a part of the main game loop for them um, yeah, 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 and were you generally given sort of x amount of bytes or bits in which to squeeze your code from the developer um I generally you know I've always worked with what I call ten <clears> percent <throat> rule okay ten percent of the memory and ten percent of the processor I don't think is uh is I think it's a fair fair whack for a, for the audio. It's a fair amount for the for the audio. Um, so uh, sometimes you know you, you get a bit more, and um, especially for some of the title screen music where there isn't a lot going on. But then I did a few other games where I, I think I did an Amstrad game where I had to squeeze everything into about two k which was for all the music, the code, and the sound effects. And so, you know, you end up like Groucho Marx, just <laughs> tearing up, you know, one clause after another, you know, and um, just ripping out bits of code and bits of things to try to squeeze it all down. You find a way somehow, though. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I mean, with the C64, then what did you have technically to work with with the SIDCHIP? I know you had three channels, but what yeah. else did you have? What other weapons did you have at your disposal with that chip? Well, the synthesizer chip was uh, standard technology because I had already had a synthesizer. And so I knew all about, 
you know, what the ring mod and the sync and the um, ADSR and all that kind of stuff was. Um, but uh, apart from the three voices, uh, it was just all down to the code. And it was hard coded in assembly language with uh, hexadecimal statements. So it was all about knowing what registers to, to poke to, to yeah, get exactly, it to do the right yeah, thing. Yeah. yeah. And if we listen to a 1985 composition um, and then a later one, let's say something like Delta, published by Thalamus Software in 88, can we listen out for any tricks or effects that might have come about through the maturing of your um, your, well, your you development? If you listen to the, uh, the, the, uh, that in-game Delta tune, it's got a lot of... Um, uh, more kind of uh, synthesizer effects with uh, filters and pulse width sweeps and uh, all, all kinds of more kind of minimalistic uh, musical mu musical elements going on. That was quite experimental f for me, really. And was that a reflection of your 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 sort of technical prowess developing, or was it just a, a shift in the type of music that people wanted? Oh, no, some of it was. Some of it was. You always try, trying to push the envelope, and for me, it was always a case of I don't want to sound like me. You know, I'm, I was always trying to um, not sound like me. Because you very rarely succeed at that, because everybody says, "Oh, I could tell it was you straight away." <laughs> you know? Well, let's have a listen to that that Delta track now, and then we'll, we'll carry on. You quickly became a prolific and, and very highly respected musician with your works, including the classics like Monty on the Run, The Last V8, One Man and His Droid, uh, yeah. Com Commando and Sanction, as, as well as plenty of uh, perhaps less well-revered games, but people would still go out and buy them just for your yeah. soundtrack. That, was, that yeah. was the reason to buy them. Were you aware that there was a, a, Rob, a, a Rob Hubbard effect on the sales of games, and were you able to use that to your advantage when choosing what work you did? No, 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 absolutely not. There was back in the eighties. Of course, there was no internet, <clears throat> so there was a thing called. There was a few magazines like um, I think Commodore User and Zap Magazine, and they used to re, you know review the games and they'd sometimes mention the music, and you know sometimes they would praise it, and sometimes they wouldn't for various odd reasons that. I could never fathom out. Um, but, you know, I had no idea what was going on. I'd, I had no idea how many games were being sold. And uh, I had no idea that, you know, anybody was really into the music that much. I certainly didn't have any clue that, you know, there was anything about, um, you know, people buying games just because it, they wanted, because of the music. Can you remember any particular uh, review or feedback that that really uh, stuck with you? Uh, one of the you mentioned there were some negative ones that you couldn't get your head around. Uh, the um, well, the Zap people were kind of like a bit of a you know a bit of a wild bunch. I mean, they really went overboard with Monty on the run. They thought that was I think they thought that was really good. 
and um, they, uh, for some reason, they didn't like Spellbound, which, you know, is in some ways is a much better composition. Yeah, that's held in quite high regard today. So, uh, yeah, very unusual feedback. Um, were you a games player yourself, Rob? Did you did you play the games um, that you worked I, on? I, um, I tried playing some of the C64 games early on, but they, I found them really, really bloody hard. <laughs> you know, I mean, Monty on the Run was just ridiculous. I couldn't get anywhere with it. Um, later on, um, you know, with the PC, I, I played uh, some of the adventure games. Um, yeah, a lot more Sierra forgiving. Sierra Online. Yeah. Um, I played some of their games, but then I found that it was really taking up too much time <clears throat> and it was distracting from, you know, the things that I really wanted to do. There was perhaps a game that you were you were less proud to work on because you did so under a pseudonym of, of John York, I believe. Tell us about that episode. <laughs> well, well, you know, I mean, they I would ne- I, I would never turn a job down. So uh because like I said before, I, I never really knew how long this stuff was going to keep going. I didn't know how long it was last. And uh, they were doing this Sam Fox script poker, which was just a really kind of a, 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 you know, a really cheesy sort of thing to do. And so um, I decided to, <laughs> to change my name for that so that um, I wouldn't be too directly associated with something as cheesy as that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, people people d- figured it out in any case. So, uh, <laughs> During this period, um, were you happy working on the game music, or did you have other aspirations that you wanted to fulfil professionally that you perhaps weren't able to at the time? Um, a bit of both, I think. I mean, uh, yeah, I was uh, I was really happy to work on the game music at that time because it was it was very exciting period and it was in a lot of ways it was a lot it was still great fun to work on um as far as aspirations are concerned i was always like thinking about um uh various kind of future things like interactive music and uh, other ways to um expand what you could do with the interactivity and that was part of the reason why I wanted to go to join EA because they were at the forefront more than any of the UK companies were. Mm, mm. Yeah, I mean, we forget EA um, have a bit of a reputation currently for their approach to uh, microtransactions and things like that. But those of us who are old enough can remember when they were a very exciting uh, and well-regarded yeah, company. Back in the late 80s, EA was a really, really exciting place. They were full of some real clever people, some real entrepreneurs and real pioneers of the industry. And they were, you know, um, hell-bent on pushing the envelope. Yeah, they really were. Well, we'll come on to your time at EA shortly. Um, I won't subject the listeners to Sam Fox Strip Poker, but you mentioned Spellbound earlier, so we'll have a listen to that one now.
So when it came to inspiration and direction for a tune, did you have to work closely with the game designers to create a sound that fit, or, or did you just work to a simple brief normally? Uh, sometimes I would go and visit the um, software house or the programmer and have a look at what they were doing. And uh, sometimes I would get a disc with a demo of the game. Um, and sometimes I would, all I would get is a brief description over the phone. Um, I would just have to try to come up with something based upon that. Mm. And did you have a preference? I mean, did you, as a musician, did you prefer the ones that were a bit more hands-off that you could just be free to work on? Um, most of the time I was pretty hands-off. Most of the time I was free. Sometimes they, you know, asked for specific, they did ask for specific things of which, you know, I tried to do a pastiche of a, a little bit. Um, and expand upon some of the basic material. Um, but I, I, by and large, I prefer to try to uh, just come up with something myself. Yeah, yeah. But I guess um, perhaps Commando falls under the type of thing you're describing there because obviously there was the existing arcade tune that you were tasked with working on and converting. Uh, but what you came up with is a, is a whole lot more funkier than the original arcade tune. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, everybody knows the story of Commando, and I went up, they had the arcade machine there at the Elite office, and, um, I, you know, I um, booted the thing up and had a quick listen to the music to see what it was doing, and um, scribbled down a few notes on my score paper, and then uh, thought, well, okay, I, I think I can uh, funk this thing up a little bit and change it, change some of the harmonies around to make it a bit more logical, make it make it a bit more make sense out of it a bit more, and uh, people might still recognise bits of it, so that should work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, it certainly did, and I think you pulled an all-nighter, didn't you, to to get that one done? It, yeah. It did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It shows how keen you were, you know. Yeah, yeah. So um, who would you say during this period were your musical influences, Rob? Oh, I would say that yeah, I got a boatload of musical influences because I, you know, write through a lot of classical, a lot of jazz stuff. And then, of course, in the 80s, there was all the, um, the new romantics and, you know, um, all that synthesizer music. John Michel Jarre and bands like The Police and uh, uh, the band that Mitch Ewer had, of which I forget the, what they were called. Um, there was a lot of those, uh, Depeche Mode. There was all that stuff going on. But I mean, I still had like a massive um, kind of uh, jazz influence with like Chick Corea and Brecker Brothers and all that stuff. And... Um, a lot of classical stuff, more kind of 20th century stuff. Vaughan Williams, who I still listen to a lot of Vaughan Williams. Um, Are there any particular tracks from your from your catalogue of C64 games where you perhaps tried to replicate any of those influences that we might be able to listen to now? Are there any that stand out? Um, no, not really. No, OK, OK. Um, in that case, we'll have a listen to Commando now. <laughs>
I mean, I give a lecture on, um, well, not a lecture, I did a talk about musical composition uh, at Bath, and I said that if you're going to compose, the first thing you should do is listen to music 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 days a year, because you absorb, um, you keep listening and listening and listening, you absorb all that influence, and in, in some respects, if you're going to compose, it, some of the stuff will bubble to the surface and you make it your own. But you've got to have that background of listening to a lot of music. And I've, you know, all my life, basically, I've listened to a lot of music. Hmm. And that continues to this day, does it? The, the passion hasn't hasn't waned for you at any oh, point? Oh, yeah. In fact, probably more so now than, you know, when I was uh, doing all that stuff back then. I listen to a lot more music now. Yeah. Well, between 1985 and uh, 88, you produced over 75 tunes for the C64, around 19 per year on average, which is perhaps why you're so remembered for that classic Sid chiptune yeah. sound. But your career goes well beyond that period. Um, we see you credited in 88 through to 96 on electronic arts titles, as you mentioned. So yeah. were you now working in-house for EA? Yeah. And was that as a composer? Is that how you were first drafted in there? Um, yeah, I mean, I went to uh, EA to do for a couple of months in 87, and I did Skate or Die. And, uh, of course, I used, you know, I'd got all that sample stuff working, and so they were blown away when they had Skate or Die. They'd never heard anything like that. Yeah, so on a C64, you'd managed to get that really nice, clean electric guitar sound, hadn't you? On, yeah, on yeah, exactly, yeah. What was the trickery behind getting that clean sound that hadn't been heard before? How did you manage that? It was the four-bit samples um, by... Uh, um, you get a non-maskable interrupt going at about five kilohertz and you, you're throwing these four-bit samples at the volume register and for some reason um, you can get the SID chip working at the same time and it comes out. Um, I didn't work so well on apparently on the later C sixty fours, but that was basically how it, you know, how it worked in a nutshell. And was um, that was that a trick that you discovered by accident? How did you come across? No, that? I mean I wasn't the first one because ah, I mean okay. there was a game called Ghostbusters mm -hmm. that had a voice sample on it. Yes, <laughs> and um, I think. Uh, I'd worked with Simon Nickel to uh, try to figure out how to get this stuff to work. And once I'd um, uh, got, the, got the, code, the code working to get the non-maskable interrupt, I um, figured a way how to convert some 8-bit samples into 4-bit samples and uh, get a system working of, so that uh, I could incorporate into a music player. Um, and obviously to change the pitch you, sp you change the speed of the non-maskable interrupt which is quite tricky to do because obviously if you change it too fast the whole machine freezes up well all that knowledge is still very fresh in your brain by the sounds of it could you could you pick up a c64 tomorrow and, and bash out a tune is it all still there rob um <laughs> 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 uh, oh god um well I had to do a couple of few SID tunes um, last year for this project that Chris Abbott was working on. So I, I had to uh, delve into the, some old uh, C64 code. Um, and I haven't got a C64, so I had to do it on an emulator. There's a thing called C6, C64 Studio, which is pretty good, and an emulator called... Uh, um, win ice or win vice or something and um yeah there was a lot of it you know starts to make sense again and some of it doesn't um but the basic structure i could still remember mm. mm -hmm. and was this for was this project hubbard was it yeah for that, yeah that project yeah yeah so um so just uh, just drifting back to EA for a bit here um obviously we know what the appeal of EA was at the time they were such a huge and exciting company did you approach well, them one of the things was that 
at the time, in 88, EA was like the, the complete leader by a mile when it came to the Amiga. Mm. And I thought, well, there's nothing happening in Europe with the Amiga. I'm going to go to EA because they're really hell-bent on, uh, you know, uh, exploring the possibilities of the Amiga. And, of course, what happened was the opposite. Yes. I go over there, the Amiga dies and takes off in Europe, and I'm, I'm in America, I'm working on a bloody PC, not an Amiga. Working on a PC with its myriad of different uh, sound cards and the PC yeah, speaker yeah, as well, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you were working now on, on the 16-bit generation then with the Atari ST, the Amiga. Um, you also did some work on the Mega Drive and more. As a musician, how did this next generation of systems stack up for you compared to what you'd been doing on the C64? Um, well, the, the um, I never had an opportunity to do that much. I only, I only did a few games on the Amiga, and um, I only did a few things on the ST. Uh, um, in America, I was um, having to do stuff on the PC, which uh, was actually quite difficult because you know you had various different formats, including the one voice little PC beeper that was on the old 8086 machines. You had a three voice Tandy format. You had a, a one operator Adlib board and then later you had an MT32 proper synth mm -hmm. yeah. uh, machine or board. Which very few people had because it was such an expensive uh, peripheral to buy the MT32. So yeah. um, the likelihood yeah, would was, be that your music wouldn't be heard by that many people in in its no, best was, form. No, um, so it was it was actually quite difficult to uh, do stuff on uh, on a on the IBM PC uh, for those reasons. And then of course, once you've got the music done, that's that's only uh, a small percentage of the job because then you've got like another forty sound effects to try to do, and. Uh, if you're going to try and support sound effects on something like a, an MT32, it's really, really difficult because you only do it through um, system exclusive data and custom patches, and uh, it just goes on and on and on. Yeah, you, well, you're certainly not talking about this period with quite as much passion as, as the C64. Um, but well, no, I mean I. I I developed a MIDI system on doing for doing this stuff, okay. and the MT32 was really a, a massive breath of fresh air compared to what had gone before, and um, so I was I was really quite into the M, you know doing stuff on the MT32, um, and then um, the the uh, the thing that kind of really turned it around. Uh, for the whole industry, uh, EA was the 16-bit uh, Sega Genesis. Mm -hmm. So um, can you give us an idea of some of the titles that you worked on for the Genesis or Mega Drive? Well, the first one that I worked on was John Madden Football. Oh, yes, yeah. And Because um, that had a distinctive uh, guitar riff in the opening tune, didn't it? I seem to remember. I yeah, digitized like drums as well because yeah. I managed to get samples working on that as well from the Z80 uh, pumping across to the 68000. Um, so th I did all the, um, at that time I was doing all the high profile EA sports games. So I did all the NHL hockey and all the golf games and Madden football and all that stuff. Well, let's have a listen now to uh, that Skate or Die example and have a listen to those nice guitar samples playing through it on the C64. Thank you. 
So credits leading into and through the 90s take us through titles including Populous, John Madden Football, Road Rash and Desert Strike. And yeah. These are all big, big games. Uh, EA was wildly successful. But how did you... Yeah, all... oh, yeah, EA was just... It was going absolutely nuts during that period. You know, the revenues were going through the roof. The expansion was crazy. And uh, it was... Uh, it was really good because the bonuses were, were great that we were getting. Oh, okay. So you, I mean, often we hear about how composers in big companies get overlooked for the bonuses and things, but you, you were well looked after, were you, by EA? Yeah, 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 I was, yeah. I mean, it was, um, it was a great place to work because you could just, if you wanted to take a day off, you just take a day off, you know. Nobody cared what hours you did as so long as that you, um, produce the goods when it was when it was necessary you know so how, how did your role evolve within ea through the 90s because you, you had a few different roles didn't you yeah i um went moved more into kind of managing different things because as the games got bigger um needed some technical direction and we had to hire some outside talent uh, voice talent and i some outside composers sometimes so i was basically taking care of all that yeah and i was in i was involved with other things um as well um like with with some guys we were trying to create standards for interactive audio and interactive music and we were <clears throat> trying to get music recognized by the organization behind the grammys so i was involved with that as well okay and um, of, of course ea and and uh, i think it was trip hawking at the time in charge uh, were really pushing the 3do system did you have any involvement with the 3do oh yeah i had a lot of involvement with that yeah um so i worked on like a couple of the early games on the well a couple of games on the 3do before, the box didn't take off at all because it was overpriced and um, it was really quickly overshadowed by the PlayStation. But I worked on um, Shockwave and I worked on John Madden Football and I worked on the uh, PGA Golf game on the 3DO. Mm -hmm. And that would have been audio streaming from CD then, would it, on those games? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of the music was, yeah. Yeah, did you enjoy that then to to have all limitations lifted to be able to just go into a studio and produce a track that way? Well, we didn't we didn't go into a studio. I mean, okay. that was part of the problem. It oh. was <laughs> kind of um, like a little bit too early for all that side of things to take off, and um, we didn't quite have the budgets to do that. So it was all done with you know synthesizers and keyboards, and so. It wasn't quite really what you know what we wanted to do standard to you know get, to get it to that kind of standard. There wasn't. It was it was awkward because it was uh, too early for that big budget uh, recording um, session type scenario to come to fruition. So, um, Rob, you are very much back on the scene now thanks to your work with the likes of Chris Abbott to reimagine your, your music with the help of a symphony and yeah. vinyl releases like the one I've got next to me, uh, Project Sidology. Uh, were you aware that there was such a big app appetite from people for your music in the present day before these projects started getting going? Um, the, well, it's, it's interesting that it's still... There is still interest in it. I mean, we did uh, back in time, 2001, I think was the first one, where everybody from the, you know, the UK industry got together in Birmingham. Uh, there was Martin Galway, there was Ben, there was Tony Crowther, there was uh, Jeff Minter. Everybody was there. And then there was 2003 in Brighton, back in time, live event and um i you know for some reason it still seems to be going stronger than ever um i mean the the uh, the response that we had at the whole concert was in, was quite incredible 
the amount of people that showed up for that concert, uh, the enthusiasm was, uh, I don't know if you were there. I wasn't at that one, no, unfortunately. Uh, but yeah, the, the period between then and now, if we're going back to 2001, is just as long as between 2001 and the original video game music. So this yeah. revival yeah. Has, has sustained just, just as long a period. Uh, yeah. and is, I mean, I think that um, people identify with uh, certain periods of their life and certain music when, the, when they're going, going through the teens and growing up and it stays with you all your life. You know, you identify with that and um, you always have a certain kind of nostalgia for it because it, it takes you back to happier times or whatever. Yeah, it really does. It really does. And your current project is the 8-Bit Symphony, in which the Czech Studio Orchestra are under your direction, along with conductor Robin Tate. To, yeah. to take tunes from the three voices of the Sid to an entire orchestra, that must be quite an experience for you, Rob. Um. Yeah, it involves basically, you know, stripping things down to well, what what was the um, underlying thing that you know we were, well, that I was trying to do with some of these tunes, and then um, uh, using your imagination, I suppose, and coming up with um, how would I, how can I visualise this with an orchestra, and um, what can I add? What can I subtract? What can I do different? What can I expand upon? And um, fortunately, the, the tools that we have now to do this are really quite incredible. Um, there's a program called Sibelius, which works with a plugin called Note Performer, which is just an absolutely amazing package. You, you, it provides you with a completely different way of working because while you're actually arranging and writing, you're thinking about the actual orchestration while you're doing it, and that kind of dictates some of the direction that you're going when you're, when you're working. Instead of like working with a piece of manuscript paper, working out ideas and then thinking about how am I going to how am I going to orchestrate this and how am I going to get this to work? You kind of bypass that step and you you you're going for more of a fully um, orchestrated orchestrated score from the get go. Mm. Mm. It sounds like a, a more organic way of of thinking, really, to piece it all together. It sounds interesting. It's not a piece of software I've come across before, I have to say, but. Um, Hopefully it helps some of listeners who are looking to do that kind of thing. Um, the 8-Bit Symphony was uh, a successful Kickstarter, I'm pleased to say. We, we had an interview not so long ago with Chris Abbott, who was pushing at the time to try and hit the Kickstarter. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, well, first of all, congratulations on, on hitting the it goal. Was a, it was a very nerve-wracking experience. <laughs> it went down to the wire. Because I, I didn't think it was ever going to make it. Yeah. You know, three hours before it finished, it suddenly started to pick up. Yeah, there was a big jump towards the end. So thankfully you hit it. Um, and that was to fund getting the orchestra together, uh, recording it, and then CDs, uh, I believe, uh, vinyls and, and other um, issues will, will be available. So I'll include links in the description and on the screen to anyone yeah. who wants to go and get more information uh, about yeah. that. Um, is it February, did you mention, that recording is Yeah, happening? February the 18th. OK, well, good luck with that. I hope it all goes well, Rob. Um, yeah. Just before we wrap it up, I've got three very quick questions uh, from listeners to put to you. Um, the first one is from Tim, and he wants to know, what is your favourite album of all time? <laughs> <laughs> just a simple question. I possibly answer that because, you know, I'm... my favourite album of all time, I don't know. It's impossible, I mean... isn't it? Yeah. Jeez, I, I, I wouldn't know where to start to answer that, you know. I... Um... I've got like, I've got so many. I mean, um, I you know, I mean, uh, I love John Williams Star Wars. Okay, we'll go with John Williams Star Wars. Um, have you ever heard the uh, the space organ version of Star Wars? Uh, it's, it's back in the seventies. There's this. Um, huge church organ in america in a in a pizza parlor um yeah. and and they cover star wars space odyssey 
um it's all sorts of tunes uh, i don't know if you've come across that robert no i haven't no, quite no. the cover yes look up space organ if you if you get the time um next one is from cage bat he says i'm very curious about your opinion on what you think is your best work of I'm, I'm presuming he means on the c64 do you have one tune on the, on the c64 there's a few things that you know obviously um uh sanctioned um knuckle busters Kentilla, spellbound mm. stand out i think yeah and and at least two of those i think sanction and spellbound will be in the 8-bit symphony is that right uh yeah 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 yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, knuckle busters is completely inappropriate for an orchestra <laughs> And then the final question comes from Gary. He says, which other composer's chip tune do you love and wish that perhaps you'd written yourself? Um, yeah, there was a, uh, obviously, um, one of my favourites was, was always Martin Galway's Ocean Loader, um, which I always really, really liked that. And it, it, to some extent, that, did have an influence on some of the direction that I was going in. Um, and um, there's like a few other things, the, some of Richard Joseph, some of Ben's stuff. Uh, yeah, I wish I'd written that as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, Rob, thank you so much for your time today, uh, for your catalogue of music that formed the soundtrack to so many of our lives and to uh, and, and for whatever you may treat us to next with this with the symphony. So uh, it's been a pleasure, sir. Thank you. Okay, thanks. If you enjoy my content and would like to support The Cave while receiving a completely ad-free experience and access to releases one week before they go public, then visit patreon.com forward slash retro man cave and join the official cave dwellers. Thank you for your support.